Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for waiting. We'd like now to start today's Yukichi Fukuza Memorial Lecture in Economics. We'd like to ask Professor Hugo Sonnenschein, President Emeritus, and Charles L. Hutchinson, Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of the University of Chicago, to grant us the honor to listen to his lecture. The title of the lecture is Incentives and Efficiency. Professor Sonnenschein, please. Thank you very much. Shall I speak from here? Yes. Good? OK, very good. Um, so uh, let, me, let me say right away um, uh, to professors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, some of you who are friends and colleagues and former students and I've known for a long time, uh, I, I'm humble to deliver the Fukuzawa Memorial Lecture. Can you all hear me? Is this working well? Can you hear me well? Good. Um, it honors your founder, and your founder was a most distinguished social scientist, uh, leader of your nation, um, and so honoring him is a good thing, and this lecture series is a wonderful event. And I follow my, my distinguished colleague, uh, Jim Heckman, of the University of Chicago, who gave this lecture um, last year. Uh, but before I begin, I, I want to recognize something that Professor Heckman may not have said, although he tends to know everything. So I have to be careful when I say this. And that is uh, about the University of Chicago. In 1893, only three years after the university was open, the University of Chicago uh, granted its first PhD. And it granted that degree to a Japanese, Eiji uh, Asada, who um, did Semitic languages, uh, later returned uh, to your country uh, and had an important um, career here. So I want to recognize uh, that. Um, as Professor Grieve has said, uh, the topic of my talk is incentives and efficiency. Um, we think of a situation where agents come together for economic exchange. Um, they're looking for individual gain. They have private incentives. There may or may not be the possibility of mutual gain. And the question is, when they follow these private incentives, uh, do you believe that it's likely, should we believe that it's likely that the results will in some sense be efficient? This is a central issue, uh, not just for economics, uh, but for all of the social sciences. And economists can be um, a little bit jaded when they think about this. If you think of the traditions of both of our societies, uh, there are many legends that explain why one should be quite skeptical about this idea that self-interested behavior uh, will promote the social good. Um, in my own traditions, there's a classical image of hell. And in this image of hell, there's a table which has large amount of food, very desirable food, quite delicious. And people have forks, and they can stab into the food in the center of the table, but the forks are in fact quite long. And if they try to feed themselves, it goes right by their ear, one way or the other. The way this can work is if they will stab the food and feed the person on the other side of the table. And of course, the image of hell is that despite the bounty that's before them, they starve because they can't coordinate. So the idea 
that people being selfish, people uh, not considering the possibility of together holding different parts of a net, catching fish together, as opposed to going out one by one. Um, uh, th this idea that, that cooperation uh, is needed and a good thing um, and will promote the social good um, is an important idea and really exists in, in my own traditions long before Adam Smith. But we're going to talk about all of this, of course, from the point of view of of economic analysis, a little bit of economic history, and some uh, modern account of economic theory. Um, and as I speak about this, I will bring into the uh, story uh, Samuelson, De Bru, McKenzie, um, um, all graduates of KO, and I, I joined them today, so it's a particularly proud day. Uh, for me. And I start with the Arrow de Bru model, which I think um, perhaps could more properly be called the Arrow de Bru McKenzie model. And, you know, we teach this model and we get a bit too used to it. Um, we, we really should step back and think about the purpose of the model. And the purpose of the model is to formalize, to test, and to make precise the claim, the admonition of Adam Smith. Now let's see whether I can make this happen the right way. Ha, ah, there's the admonition. And the admonition is that each individual search for private gain promotes the social good. The idea that selfish behavior can somehow lead to a good outcome. And the Arrow de Bru McKenzie model and the theory that follows from it is about an analysis of that claim. So you have the claim up in front of you. Um, I could read the first quote, very famous. Every individual neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own security, and by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value to him, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end, the social good, which was no part of his intention. Each individual search for private gain promotes the social good. And then an amplification below, no matter whatever bureaucrats do to get in the way of this, it's a powerful force. And then just for the fun of it, I add at the bottom something very different. Um, um, Adam Smith had deep moral sense and sensitivity, and uh, he believed that income inequality was a problem for society. So how well this invisible hand does in promoting the social good in terms of uh, lack of large inequality uh, is, of course, another issue. Suffice it to say that there is very little as famous or as powerful in social sciences as this quote. Um, uh, you can also go to Marx and get some of equal power and, and importance. But uh, that would be different. That would be a different, a different story. So the Arrow de Bru model uh, builds on the work of the father of general equilibrium analysis. And of course, that's Léon Valras, uh, 1875 more or less. Elements comes out over a few years. And it proceeds as follows. 
And I hope you'll excuse me. You know, many of you in the audience are professionals who teach this every day. And I'm going along in something of a slow and pedantic uh, manner. But this is also a general uh, talk. And I want to emphasize uh, what's most basic as I do this. So the analysis proceeds as follows. And again, very carefully. The demand for and the supply of each commodity depends on the prices of many other commodities. Not just its own price, but the prices of other commodities. Professor Maruyama's demand for 2010, Gevray Chambertin, depends on the price of that fine wine but it also depends on the price of other fine wines and the price of beef, the price of sushi, the price of clothing, of heating one's home, and of other goods and services and commodities that are both necessary or part of uh, leading a, a rather favored life. Similarly, the supply of a fine wine depends on its price, but also on the price of labor. Because if you go to these vineyards, you see people laboriously taking care of them. It's a very labor-intensive effort. Depends on the price of land. Depends on the price of gasoline, because these days you'll find equipment that's gas-powered, that's used on the vineyard. So the demand and the supply of each commodity by each individual economic agent depends on many prices. And the market or aggregate demand and supply is obtained by summing these individual demands over the various economic agents. The difference between market demand and supply, that is demand minus supply, is termed market excess demand. And an economic system is in equilibrium when market excess demand for each commodity is zero. Supply equals demand for the first commodity. Supply equals demand for the second, etc. Supply equals demand for all commodities which leads to the bad joke that an economist is a parrot who knows nothing except supply equals demand, supply equals demand. Thus, it is the market excess demand functions which are the fundamental equation system for determining when markets are in equilibrium. It is the multi-market generalization of the idea that price is determined by supply equals demand. The Valrhasian equation system is basic. And this is the Valrhasian equation system. One might say that Valras is our Newton. His equation system Valras's equation system is our theory of gravity. Arrow de Bruyne Mackenzie made the Valrhasian model precise. And not just mathematically precise, they made it rigorous, understandable, communicatable, something that was common to us. And they provided conditions under which every well-defined economy has at least one equilibrium set of prices. More precisely, they showed that to every well-defined economy, the associated system of excess demand functions 
had the property that there was some price, vector of prices, price for each individual commodity, that would make supply equal demand for every commodity. Furthermore, and this was a lot of what this whole project was really after, and now one really has to give special credit to, to Arrow uh, and some substantial independent credit to De Bruyne. They observed that in a very general um, way, all equilibrium states are efficient all states driven by prices that make supply equal demand are efficient, provided, and now the, the statements that all of you know and you teach uh, for many of you, that there are no externalities in production and consumption, no monopolistic elements. In their model, in the Arrow de Bruyne Mackenzie, there are always prices that equate supply and demand when consumers and producers consume and produce selfishly and purely for private gain. And in these states, the social good is promoted. And now a caveat, it turns out that the notion of promoting the social good is a rather narrow one. It has nothing to do with income inequality. It simply has to do with the, and you know this, many of you, with the idea of Pareto optimality. There's an efficient allocation of resources in the sense that you can't make one person better off without making somebody else worse off. Hurwitz called this non-wastefulness, perhaps a better word than Pareto optimality. And that is a powerful affirmation of Smith's admonition. One models the idea of an economy where people just do the best for themselves. Producers maximize profits. Consumers maximize utility. And the result has an efficiency property. But what more can be said about this fundamental set of equations, this fundamental equation system, the excess demand system? What follows from the hypothesis that the market excess demand system is generated by, and now a very, <laughs> you know, it's a, such a Chicago phrase also, rational economic agents rational choice. What follows from that hypothesis? What follows from the hypothesis that the demands and supplies and thus the equilibrium follows from the behavior of agents who pursue solely their own gain? The Sun and Shine Mantel de Bruyne theorem tells us that these systems have no special structure. Beyond telling us that there are some prices that clear all markets simultaneously, they tell us no more. Too bad. Science proceeds by demonstrating the fruitfulness of hypotheses. The name of the game is to think about testable and refutable hypotheses, to test them, to try and refute them, and to look at the implications. The hypotheses of Newtonian mechanics leads to important structure. I probably should stand for this part. So here's the structure. The structure is, if I have an object and I drop it from this height, and I don't even know maybe the height that it was dropped from, don't even have that information, but I observe it here, 
and I know the amount of time that it takes to get to here, then I can tell you exactly the time when it will hit the ground. Maybe a problem to do it the way that I did it, but I think you can get the idea. That's an implication of the, of the model. It's a powerful implication. It gives you structure. If I know something about, I don't have to know the color of the ball that I'm dropping, the object I'm dropping. I don't have to know its mass. In fact, those things turn out to be irrelevant. But if I know wherever I've dropped it from, its height, he its, its, its velocity here, and its velocity here, I know exactly when it hit the ground. That's what structure gives you. My too bad remark is because the hypothesis of selfish behavior tells us nothing general about the evolution of economic systems. This is an implication of the Sun and Shine Mantel de Bruyne result. So why is it Sun and Shine Mantel de Bruyne? We didn't work together, actually. These two people were more clever than me. I proved the theorem. Uh, Mantel, pretty shortly after, did a much better job um, uh, of, of sharpening the result. Um, uh, and, and then De Bruyne just did it perfectly. Um, uh, so it was teamwork, but it was intertemporal uh, teamwork. And Samuelson is clear in his foundations that this kind of a result is very bad news. For him, for Samuelson, the rational agent hypothesis is intended to lead to empirical restrictions on behavior, uh, such as the strong axiom of real, revealed preference. Uh, and two years ago, uh, you honored my late um, uh, former colleague, uh, Marcel Richter, uh, with an honorary degree. Uh, he was a student of Samuelson, and he was um, very interested in understanding most deeply uh, the strong axiom of revealed preference. But again, the point is that the rational agent hypothesis does lead to empirical restrictions, but only for one agent. And what Sun and Shine Mantel de Bruyne tells us is that these empirical restrictions completely evaporate at the market level. And this lack of structure, and now I push things a little bit, and one, one could have a debate, tells us that the dynamic that has prices rise for goods when there is an excess of supply relative to demand and has prices fall for goods when there is too much demand, this dynamic goes back to Fall Ross. It's something uh, we teach in elementary uh, classes. This dynamic will not necessarily lead to equilibrium prices. Excess supply can foster still greater excess supply. As in housing bubbles, as in stock market bubbles. And when there are bubbles or cycles, the economy can be far from supply equals demand equilibrium. And it can be that way for considerable periods of time which brings the relevance of supply equals demand equilibrium into question. And remember, it's supply equal demand equilibrium for which we have the result 
of economic efficiency. So if you don't get there, you don't get to the claimed efficient state. I must tell you that when I, when I speak with my chemistry colleagues uh, about the way we do equilibrium analysis and dynamics, they look at me in a curious way. They really don't understand how one can separate the two. They say, what do you mean by equilibrium if you don't have a well understood theory of adjustment and a theory of adjustment that works. So this is among the more disturbing implications of the SMD result. It can be seen as undermining Smith's admonition. If in fact you have an economic system and there's no reason to believe it gets to equilibrium, then what, what does it mean to talk about the efficiency of equilibrium? To say this another way, the observation is that self-interested behavior may not always easily bring us to supply equals demand equilibrium and thus efficiency. Now, it's fair to ask uh, if this is a mathematical possibility or something real. You know, are we talking here about what mathematical economists do for a living? Or are we talking about something that should affect all of us or could affect all of us? And the frank answer is that I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know enough. I'm not so sure that anybody knows enough. Uh, this year, uh, I attended at Chicago uh, a lecture by Mervyn King, I think now Lord King, uh, the long-term governor of the Bank of England and the governor during the 2008 uh, crisis. And he was trying to unpack 2008. Um, uh, he was trying uh, to understand what's going on today. And he started imagining a, mo a model uh, that really concerned the inability to, of prices to adequately give the appropriate signals uh, to bring you to efficient allocation of resources. Um, this had to do with more um, fancy topics that I'm talking about had to do with the absence of complete futures markets. Um, it had to do with failure of some kinds of rational expectations equilibrium. But it's hard to say what that means when there isn't even the markets in which to express them. Suffice it to say that the model that he was beginning to imagine, and being an old man like me, he was calling for others to do this uh, really was very much a story of somehow we don't have the situation where supply equals demand and we're able to rely on the arrow de Bruyne thinking and result. And goodness knows, um, we do feel that we're seeing a lot uh, at times of inefficiency uh, in our markets. Um, in fact, what would be surprising would be for me to claim that markets just work perfectly well. Leave it alone. It'll be fine. That kind of idea is not particularly uh, strong. The idea that is strong is that if we try and do better than the markets are doing, we may make it worse. That would be rather Chicago. But the idea that markets work um, perfectly um, is, 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 is difficult to peddle today. So let me do a review at a high level. 
I have to check the time, so I uh, don't want to keep you over. Um, uh, we're concerned with incentives and efficiency. Uh, one models the idea of a competitive economy. We have results that say Valrhazy and equilibrium are efficient. Uh, but there are some difficulties that I'm pointing to. And those difficulties have to do with the ability of markets to find equilibrium, to place themselves in a position of equilibrium. And without there being an equilibrium, the whole intuition of um, the, the, the benefits of perfect competition, the, the claim, the bold claim of um, Smith has a little bit um, uh, difficulty. So now, I'm going to switch gears, and it seems to me that given the time schedule, I may have to move a little faster with this one. Um, it's also incentives and efficiency, but not in markets. We're going to turn to bilateral exchange. So we talked about incentives and efficiency. We talk about it in markets. We see Adam Smith's claim. We know the history. We see some difficulty in getting to an efficient allocation of resources through markets. I don't want to say it's paralyzing. I don't want to say that the alternatives are better. But there's a difficulty. I switch gears now. I'm going to talk about incentives and efficiency but not in markets, I'm going to turn to bilateral exchange. And this is the heart of the Nash program. Uh, for many years, uh, I taught at Princeton University. Uh, I was the provost of that university eventually. Uh, and John Nash was among the people uh, during his less well times who um, strolled the lovely um, yards of Princeton. And the idea now is the following. It's very different than the, the idea of markets. Two parties come together to trade. They're both impatient. There might, for example, be a seller of a rug on the one hand, wants to get rid of the rug, may not value it as much as a buyer might value it, and a buyer of the rug. The buyer may value the rug more than the seller. And let's assume that the buyer values it more than the seller. And they both know this. And if there is benefit, that's an exchange that should take place quickly. Will it take place quickly? One can also consider the seller of labor, a labor union and the buyer of labor, management. And let's say there's a deal that should be done. And they're both impatient. If this deal doesn't get done immediately, there's a strike. Management isn't producing goods and making money. The laborers aren't getting paid. If there is benefit, they should trade immediately, provided they're impatient. And the best result about this is due to Ariel Rubinstein. And the result is, and this is a game theory uh, result, uh, and the result is that if the values are known, and if it's known that the buyer values the rug more than the seller, then trade will happen immediately. This is actually a deep result. It's kind of like uh, the Arrow de Brewer result. Um, Rubinstein formalizes the process of bargaining and he proves a theorem that trade must take place immediately at a determinate price. And of course the price reflects the relative impatience of the two agents. However, there's a problem. And the problem arises when there's uncertainty 
about the valuations that the agents have. Now, I'm not getting, well, maybe I can use the pointer. Let's try it. Okay, I can do it. So let's start with the case where we look at the seller. The seller, one half of the time, 0.5, has value zero. He doesn't care at all for the rug. And one half of the time, he has value eight. He knows his value. The buyer only knows it statistically. This is the world of game theory. The buyer might have value two, a low value, or value 10. And he has each of these values with equal probability. And these distributions are IID, to put in a technical term. So independently, nature picks a seller who might be of this type or this type, and a buyer who might be of this type and this type, or this type. If you're a seller, you know your type. You know whether you really don't care to have this rug, or it's kind of valuable to you. But you don't know whether you're facing a buyer who is eager to buy, that is, values it at 10, or values it at 2. So there's an incentive problem. And since time is going by, and you're probably getting impatient, I don't want to say too much about this, other than you can see that a seller who has value zero and who gets a price which depends on the value that the buyer thinks he has will perhaps come out and say, look, uh, you think that I have value zero for this, but I really kind of like this rug. I don't mind keeping it in my house and living with it. And let's, in fact, push things a bit and see whether we can imagine a situation where the buyer and seller come out and tell the truth. And let's say if they tell the truth, then they split equally the surplus that's available. So for example, by that I mean if a seller who values it at zero says he values it at zero, and a buyer who values it at two says he values it at two, and if they announce that those, price, those valuations, then they trade it at a price of one. Okay? And let's assume if a seller who has value eight says he has value eight faces a buyer who has value 10 and says he has value 10, there's a surplus here of two, and perhaps they trade at nine, and they each get a little bit of surplus. Of course, if it's the seller who doesn't much care about it, beating the buyer who really wants it, there's quite a lot of surplus. Let's say it trades at five. So let's assume that's the way it goes, and think of a seller coming out and saying, well, I can tell the truth, or I can say that I have a high valuation. If I say I have a high valuation, and the other person, the buyer, tells the truth, then half the time I'm not going to trade it. He values it at two, I value it at eight. But it is the case that half the time I'm going to get a price of nine. And that's better than I can do, even though I'm only getting that half the time, than I do if I tell the truth. You can work that out. That's not a, a hard thing to do. The, there's an incentive to misrepresent. And this leads to bad results some of the time. You might, for example, have a seller come out who has value zero and meets a buyer who has value 10, and there's lots of room for trade. But the seller says, okay, I'm going to cheat up and make believe that I really like this rug. And the buyer says, I'm going to cheat down and say, I don't want it much. And they don't trade or they have to wait a while to trade. That's not a good thing. So when they act strategically, it doesn't always promote the social good. And this means there are bad results, at least some of the time. 
And actually, labor economists use this model to explain strikes. Um, they, they, they rely on something a bit more sophisticated. The fact is that you can't fix this problem. And the fact that you can't fix this problem is called um, the, the Meyerson uh, Satterthwaite. I'm, I'm really enjoying speaking about my colleagues. Meyerson is a colleague at the University of Chicago and a Nobel laureate, as are many of my colleagues, I should tell you. And Satterthwaite is a, um, a, a co-author of mine uh, at Northwestern University. Um, uh, and, and they prove that this is a genuine problem. You, it's a problem that can't be, that can't be solved. Uh, you can't solve this efficiently. And again, labor economists use this to explain strikes. So I'm going to now uh, move to uh, the close, uh, because here what I will offer uh, is in the opposite direction of what I offered before. Before I said that you look at the Arrow de Bru result and the rather shiny uh, idea that competition leads to uh, efficiency, and I was putting a damper on that. Okay. Here we have a damper, and the damper is the Meyerson Satterthwaite theorem. And I want to talk about some recent work um, that um, I'm in the middle of doing uh, with my colleagues Matthew Jackson um, and Yi Cheng Ting, uh, a graduate student of his. Jackson was my student, and Ting is Jackson's student, so this is a three generation paper. Uh, very nice to be involved in that sort of thing. Uh, and also, I'm working with um, Christus Tambasos, Australia, uh, Omar Al-Ubaldayi uh, of Bahrain um, uh, on this, but in different ways. And I'm going to be speaking about the um, Jackson, Zing, uh, Sun and Shine theoretical part of this um, for the moment. So before I head straight to that, I want to note, oops, let's see, ah yes, I want to note that consultants tell us how uh, we should think about situations when they're more complex than just this simple exchange problem that I talked about. Uh, labor management contracts are complex. They're often multidimensional. Uh, the uncertainty that exists may have more to do with uncertainty regarding the value of aspects of a contract than whether or not labor and management should settle. Now let me try and say what I mean by that. The uncertainty may have to do with more aspects. So the value that workers attach to one health plan versus another may be very uncertain. How they compare this with the value of time off for childcare, or pension provisions, or time off for sick days. Similarly, the uncertainty in these kinds of labor management negotiations may have to do with how management views the cost of these different provisions. So it's not just whether or not they should make a deal, but how they value the ingredients of a deal. If labor and management bargain separately over these things, then you would be back in the situation that we were here when you bargained over each individual item. However, when people really bargain and call in consultants and are experienced, they realize that in complex negotiations, people want different things. One of these benefits, one of these parts that can be put into a contract may be worth more than others. 
They suggest that one invent options for mutual gain. Think about a way to satisfy the other in a way that is good for you. Think about what you'd like to walk out of the meeting with. Place multiple items on the table. Broaden your options. That's the counseling you get. Now, that's, that's absolutely not possible to do in this world, which is one dimensional. But if you were bargaining over a labor contract, you have many dimensions. And that may be where the important uncertainty is. So I'm going to now give a quick idea of how one handles this from a theoretical perspective. A Little bit harder now. I want to go back to the idea of rugs. And I want you to think of a world where there are two rugs that the buyer has and two rugs that the seller has. And the valuations may be eight for the first rug and zero for the second, or zero for the first and eight for the second. So that's the seller's situation. He knows his valuations for the two rugs. What he doesn't know is how the buyer values these rugs. The buyer may think the first rug is worth two and the second one ten, or the, sec or the first one ten and the second one two. It's getting a little harder, okay? So think about a world where you come to bargain over rugs, but it's now complex. You're going into a bazaar. There are two rugs. There might be 20 rugs. And if you're the seller, you know the cost of those rugs to you. What you don't know is the valuation that the buyer has for each of these. So if you, and now I will um, um, sort of go into the home stretch, if you think of yourself involved in this kind of situation, you could bargain over the rugs one by one. And Meyerson Satterthwaite tells you this doesn't work, that there are fundamental incentives to misrepresent preferences and not make a trade every time you should. But in fact, there are easy ways of solving this problem via a negotiation if you follow the admonition that the consultants tell us. Put multiple items on the table. Look for mutual gain. What do you say to each other? Well, if I was a 08 seller, I really like that uh, second rug relatively. The first one I'm willing to dump. I don't know whether I face a 210 or a 102. So I might say the following, look, I'll sell you the first rug at five. That's all we're gonna do. That does very well against the 10-2. Or I'll give you a choice of taking both for 12. Now think about that. If I give you a choice of taking both for 12, I don't know whether you're the 210 or the 1012 or 102. But you will solve that problem by knowing who you are of deciding which to take. And we will get the efficient exchange done. If this is a little hard for you, write out that little thing and then write down a note which says that the 08 should say, look, I'll give you the first one for five, but if you want both, I'll give it to you for 12. That's actually the way people negotiate. What does the 8-0 do? The 8-0 says, look, I'll give you the second one for five, or I'll give you both of them for 12. Okay? That's also what an efficient mechanism does. Professor Grave knows that well. But you don't have to have a mechanism. You don't have to have somebody who's designing a game. You can just have people come out and negotiate. So we're studying this kind of an idea both from a theoretical perspective but also
from an experimental perspective. You put people in these situations and you see how they negotiate. Okay, this, this, that's all folks, as they say. Uh, incentives and efficiency are at the center of social sciences. Negotiation, the way that people make deals, both in markets and in bilateral situations, is central to our well-being. Much in the news is TPP, important for your country, important for my country. It had to be negotiated. My colleague Jim Heckman came and talked to you about the benefits of early childhood interventions in education. And he does this in a very compelling way. Um, but then it has to be sold. Uh, you have to get municipalities, governments, to back these kinds of ideas. It has to be bargained for. In legislators, people who want it may have to give up something else to get it. But slowly, as we consider these deep questions, I think we make progress. There's a real evolution from Smith to Valras to Arrow de Bruy. In addition, there's the problem of getting to equilibrium. I wanted to mention uh, Takashi Nagishi, great, a great economist who uh, really did some of the most important work on getting to equilibrium. From Nash to Rubinstein to Meyerson to Satterthwaite to the kinds of things that we're attempting to do, we understand these things better and better. It's a collective effort uh, to which our great universities contribute. We learn, even the great Samuelson learns. When I was 28 um, years old or 27 years old, uh, I did the sun and shine part of sun and shine Mantel de Bruy. Um, and I sent it off to Samuelson. <laughs> and Samuelson wrote back in kind of a scratchy page. He said, this cannot be true. Samuelson didn't like the idea that um, the, the hypothesis of utility maximizing behavior and uh, um, profit maximizing behavior had no import, uh, had, had no, gave no results at the aggregate market level. And so he started writing out a proof that this couldn't be true. And then he says, well, maybe it is true. <laughs> um, so theory advances, theory and empirics must come together. Um, uh, and we work to do that. Um, and, I, and I think of, you know, to go back uh, to Fukuzawa, uh, Fukuzawa moved social science uh, forward uh, in your country um, and uh, was absolutely heroic uh, in doing it. Um, um, we have further to go, uh, and I think we have the privilege of participating in all of this. Um, I, wa I want to thank many people who uh, made my visit uh, possible uh, and made it uh, such a great uh, pleasure. Um, I've taught undergraduate students while, while I've been here for a week. I've taught graduate students, and I have the pleasure of giving this um, uh, public uh, lecture. Uh, so a, a particular thank you uh, to Professor Grieve. And uh, thank you to, to my friends, uh, many of you who worked, uh, Professor Kawamata uh, and others to, to make this um, possible. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Sonnenschein. It is our honor and pleasure to invite you to here. So now we'd like to have a hold, hold a brief question and answer session. And uh, 
Okay, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and Asha will bring you a microphone and then please stand and uh, tell us uh, your name and affiliation. Okay, so is there anybody who wants to ask uh, some questions? This is a great chance to <laughs> ask a question. You shouldn't feel compelled, I should tell you. I, I, um, again, I've been teaching for the, past, for the past week, and there I walk around and I go like this. You, in fact, asked me questions when I spoke to undergraduates, so you have a chance to do it again. <laughs> Um, and I have former students who are used to asking me questions. Um, but, you know, it's also nice to, to go and, and uh, have refreshments. I will stay around. Um, and uh, if you don't have them now, I will not, uh, I promise not to be offended. Um, but I also will be available to talk to you um, um, during the uh, later session. What would you like? Yes, we can wait one minute if somebody is uh, willing to now change their mind and ask uh, a question. <laughs> we shouldn't make people suffer. Let, <laughs> let's, uh, it's okay. So. Okay, okay. Then uh, this concludes the Professor Sunshine's Yukichi Fukuzawa Memorial Lecture in Economics. Thank you very much, Professor Sunshine. So Mrs. Sonnenschein and Professor Sonnenschein will now leave the hall, so please uh, give them applause. <laughs>